Uh, who in here? Who in here would like to hear a hear a story about how my office burnt down? All right, I think everybody everybody should uh, should have a friend whose office burnt down because you don't want your office to burn down, but you but it's it's good to know somebody who's gone through this, right? And I, I, I went through this presentation just a while ago in the room, and I predict that at the end of the lecture, m- most every one of you are going to be on the phone uh, verifying your insurance in some way, shape, or form, because I can, the reason I say that is, at lunch I just talked to two of my friends, and they're like, hey Griff, hold up a minute, and they're on their cell phones looking up their insurance agent's phone number and actually making calls right there because it really can save you hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, you know, so, so anyway, we're, what, I, w- I thought you guys would be the very first people that would hear this story completely. And this is not complete, but Michael Silverman from Doc. Anybody know him, Dr. Silverman? They don't, he runs this Doc's organization, Conscious Sedation stuff. They've got a magazine, and he called me up, and... And he said, hey, man, I heard about your deal. He said, but uh, I would love to do a story about it. So I sent him some photographs, and they did a story, and it just came out, uh, I believe, Wednesday. So uh, he actually beat me to the punch with my own story. But uh, so a fire, so we talked about, and I have, I have made some stupid mistakes around in my life. The fire is not one of them. That's just an act of God. Um, you know, we talked about yesterday how I'd made some terrible mistakes about how in, uh, picking my associateship out of school, and I made this terrible mistake about how to, the direction my practice should go in uh, right after I got my own practice, you know, and I messed up there, and then I made some terrible decisions about uh, how to get going and, and, and how to coach my team and, and, you know, how to lead my team, and, or in my case, a lack of leadership for a long time. Uh, those were all self-inflicted wounds, but in the last few years I've had a couple that were not self-inflicted. Uh, the good news is, when the fire hit, I had a good many of my ducks in a row because before the fire, 2009, actually, I told you guys I met Dr. Schumann, who just spoke a while ago. I met him in Dallas and uh, at a marketing event. I'm driving home. Actually, I hate, while people are still streaming in, let me just take a minute to tell this story if you haven't heard it. Well, this is a true story. Uh, so, you know, we hung out, and I'm headed in from Dallas. Um, the last lectures on Sunday of that event, that went through Sunday, I decided I wanted to go on home. I just wanted to skip out. So uh, I go to the valet there at the hotel, and uh, I say, hey, can you go grab my truck? And so it's always a bad sign when the valet doesn't come back for like half an hour, and nobody else is getting their car. All right, that's a bad sign. Because they're not busy. It's in the middle of a Sunday, 30 minutes. So anyway, 30 minutes later, the valet comes back with somebody that looks like probably a head valet or something like that, which is also a bad sign. And they come and say, Sir, uh, we got a problem. Your car won't start. Do we have permission to try to jump it off? And, uh, and I said, Okay, great. So they, they jumped it off and got it started. They said, well, maybe, sir, the battery was just dead. You may have left something on inside, whatever. And I'm thinking, you know, that's possible. Maybe you're right. Uh, But I'm in Dallas on a Sunday afternoon, and I've got to drive to Ripley, Mississippi, which is about a 10-hour drive. And so I start leaving the the hotel there, and uh, I notice the, the charge, you know, the little charge indicator is just easing in the wrong direction. And, and, I, and I, you know, it never happens on my vehicle, and I'm like, Huh, that doesn't seem good either. So uh, on the way out of town, I stopped in uh, Rockwall, Texas. You ever been there, Dr. Phelps? I have. Dr. Phelps lives in Rockwall, Texas, right? Don't you live there close to it? So I stopped at like an auto zone or something right there, and uh, they closed at 5, but they were open, and uh, they had a real nice guy, and he came out and looked at it, and he said, yeah. He said, your alternator's not working. He said, we can... He said, we can't put another alternator on there for you, uh, but tomorrow morning, they probably could do it and have you home. You know, tomorrow afternoon, I'm thinking, man, I got a full day of patient schedule tomorrow. What am I going to do, you know? Uh, and I said, what do you think? Said, I said, let me ask you a question. Is there any way in the world that I could 
like, just get home without getting a new alternator? He said, how far you got to go? I said, I lied. I said, Memphis. I really had to go two hours past that. And he goes, ooh, Memphis, that's going to be cutting it close. He said, I'll tell you what, if you'll let me put about a two-hour slow charge on this thing, this battery, you might get to Memphis. Uh, and I said, and he said, if you don't run your air conditioner. And I said, of course, this is, a, you know, hot. End of May is real hot. But I said, fine, fine, fine. So I went, and I found a little restaurant, and I sat and ate, which I hate to do by myself, waited a couple hours, come back. He had it charged up. Now, you think I'd have enough sense to think, hey, man, uh, why don't you sell me a brand-new battery and a wrench, and then if it, this one plays out, I'll just put a new battery on there. But for some reason, didn't think about it. So I start heading in. Um, and, you know, Sunday is after 5 by this point. Got a 10-hour drive. You know, there's basically no help if the thing goes dead. I got about to Texarkana, Arkansas, and I started seeing lightning in the background. Uh, as I got closer, I turned on local radio. Sure enough, severe thunderstorm warning. So I go through some hail. I get up under a, a little, I stop in Texarkana, get there, and then the tornado sirens go off. So then I pull out my phone, you know, and I'm trying. Back then, I didn't have an iPhone. This was like 2009. You know, I had like a Samsung, and the Internet connection wasn't like an iPhone, you know. But I, I tried to find some radar on there, and I'm like, darn, this storm's headed exactly my way. But if I get on the interstate, maybe I can. So the whole time, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't turned the key off my truck because I don't want the battery to go dead. So I get on the interstate, and I'm hightailing it through hail and stuff. And I get on through Texarkana. Tornadoes, you know, they don't hit me. But all the way from Texarkana to Little Rock, and then from Little Rock to Memphis, I mean, I'm just like watching the radar, and of course the windows are down, I'm getting rained on, because I can't, <laughs> right, because it's too hot to not have the windows down, but I'm getting rained on if I don't, you know, so I, this is miserable. And uh, I'm looking at the radar, and I'll see, well, the, the storm cell's about to pass the interstate, so I'll pull off at a gas station, wait 30 minutes, whatever. Anyway, about 4.30 in the morning, I finally finagle my way, and I've, I'm 20 miles from my house. Um, and, you know, the battery's about to play out. Uh, it's, the rain's terrible. Uh, the radar shows another, like a tornado cell, and a sure enough, tornado cell is headed for Ripley, uh, but I think I can beat it. So I whip in to my driveway, and uh, the tornado sirens are going off right then. I've actually got not only me and my family are awake at that hour, but Kim Hobson, who took her class this morning? All right, Kim and her husband and kids have come to my house because in my basement I have a tornado shelter, right? And, uh, and another employee and her husband are at my house. So everybody, we go down to the tornado shelter. So I like whip in, go to the tornado shelter. So the next day I wake up, I mean, the tornado didn't hit my house. It did hit the area and it was awful. Some people died and everything. But the next day I wake up to this. So the tornado brought torrential rains also, that, those storms. And so... My whole parking lot and the first three feet of my building are submerged in water. Now, it looks a little worse than what it really was then. Water just barely got into the actual part that you live in. So all my air-conditioned units, all of the ductwork, the plumbing, the electricity, and everything that was under the building, all that was gone. But the inside, we cleaned up pretty quickly and didn't lose much on the inside on that. But it did give me a wake-up call, and I said, you know, Chris you better start getting your stuff together because if you had lost the whole building, what would you have done, right? And so I started getting my ducks in a row. Started getting my ducks in a row. Uh, then, you know, things are clicking along nicely and I don't think much else about it. And uh, here, is, here is a good example. You know, you always hear about free publicity is great. <laughs> right? Hey, you know, how many times you've been to a marketing conference, they said, how awesome would it be to get on the front page of the paper? You don't even have to pay for it. <laughs> well, that's not, that's not the way you want to get that. But it is advertising, I suppose. Um, that is my building. So let me, let me walk you through this evening. So the night of May 21st happened, you know, just like any other night. I had taken my little girl to... Uh, to dance practice, and I was picking her up, picked her up at 8 o'clock or 8.30, picked her up at 8.30, and um, dance studio's not far from my office, drove right past it on the way home, a big storm was coming, 
It was starting to rain a little, but, you know, my office is just looking like it always does, perfectly fine, say, at 845. I get home, you know, I tell the kids, hey, pay attention to the weather. If we have to go downstairs to the basement, we will. Um, and then at 9 o'clock, I get a phone call from a fireman's wife that knew my wife and said, tell your husband his office is on fire. And I'm like, she comes in there and she says, Chris, you're off. I'm, in, I'm laying in the bed working on like an article for dental economics or something on my laptop. And she said, your office, they say your office is on fire. So, I mean, I shot out of bed, no socks, just slipped my feet in some shoes, had on a T-shirt and a pair of shorts you play basketball in, and I'm out the door. Um, this is, I didn't take any of these pictures, by the way. I mean, I was, had other concerns. But after the fact, people would send me pictures and say, hey, did you see this cool picture of your office on fire? <laughs> you know? So, I mean, I said, hey, if you're going to send them to me, I may as well use them, right? So, uh, anyway, I get down there. The first thing I did was I asked, I ran up to a fireman, and they're just getting there, too. The fireplace is, like, less than a block away from my office. I mean, who would have suspected that something could, could get to burning that fast? This, is the, this was the view from one side, uh, like from the bank that's next door, and this is the view from where they were letting people stand. But I went up to a fireman, and I said, what can I do? And he said, well, unlock the doors if you can. So I went to the one door, and, you know, it's a bad sign. At that time, that end was just smoking. Um, and I touched the door to unlock it, and the door's hot, so that's not good. So I opened the door, and I mean, have, has anybody ever smelled that burning building smoke? Who, have y'all had that smell? I mean, it's bad. I, I, don't know what, I don't know where it comes from. I don't know if it's plastic that melts with it, but like blackish green chemical smell and smoke just billows out on me so then I, I open that then another firefighter slams the door real quick and said whoa doc that thing's gonna catch up if we leave a door open so then another one runs up to me and says hey where's your med gas well I didn't thought of that right so you got two nitrous tanks and two oxygen tanks you know about yay high and uh, I said uh-oh so the med gas the med gas is right under that orange part right there on the other end of the building so we run around in the rain, and by now it's just storming like crazy, even hailing at times. And we run around to the back of the building. Uh, there's a door back there. And he said, uh, he said, have you got a key? Have you got a key? And I said, man, I don't think I got a key to this one. And another firefighter, I mean, they, they love this stuff. Don't let them tell you they don't. Another guy goes, oh, I got a key. Boom. And he just <laughs> kicks the door. And it just shatters. And now this guy doesn't have a mask on or anything. And he charges in. You know, it's like he's in the movies. And, uh, of course, the black smoke billows out. About three seconds later, he comes out of the smoke just coughing. And he goes over to the ditch bank and starts puking. So then two more firefighters come up. And they said, all right, Doc, where, is, where are they? And luckily from that door, they were only about eight feet ahead. You couldn't see them. but just eight feet straight ahead. So they put those masks on. You could hear things chirping, you know, those sensors they were. It sounded like the footage from 9-11, you know, things just chirping, chirping, chirping. I mean, it is surreal. And uh, they go in there, and the fire is actually blazing right above the cabinet or the closet where I kept the, the four gas containers. Um, and, and, of course, you know, those things are held in there by a chain also. And I didn't think about it, but the chain, I don't even know where the, the key to that lock is. I guess the, air, the, the gas company has the key to that lock. So they got to get chain cutters. They cut them, and all this time it's burning right above their head. And they cut the lines, and they start pulling those tanks out. And, I mean, it was heroic the way they did that. Because I would assume if, if one of those had caught on fire or exploded, it would have been like a bomb, right? I mean, can you imagine that much compressed gas? And you've seen those huge tanks. I mean, I assume it would have been terrible. But they got them out. After that, the fire had gotten pretty bad. Uh, I pretty much went and stood over here, watched the, and I'm just standing in the rain with my dad's there at this time, my cousin. People are just showing up by the droves and watching the place burn. And, uh, and we, there wasn't much we could do. I had a metal roof on the place. The fireman told me later uh, the metal roof acted like a grill cover. So lightning had struck my attic or struck the roof not even the highest point, by the way. I, you know, I thought lightning hit the highest point of the building. It hit about 15 feet down one slope, and uh, it caught the attic on fire. The flames apparently spread through all three wings of my building. 
had a, you know, if you guys have been to my office, a lot of you have been to my office, it was a nice, you know, big building. It didn't look that big, but it was about 7,000 square feet, and it was in, sort of had three wings, and so it spread in the whole attic, and then the fire consumed the attic, and after that, the floors gave way, and the floors fell down into the main part, burning, and so that's when the lower level burned. Um, the firemen couldn't fight it well because the metal roof kept them from being able to get to it. So uh, I'm not saying the metal roof caused me to have worse damage than I would have. Who knows? I mean, I don't know. But I'll tell you this. My next building that I build, if it burns down, it'll burn down with a shingle roof. Um, <laughs> you know, it may go faster that way. I don't know. But it won't happen to me twice with a metal roof. I know that. Um, one of the hardest things when your place is, is burning down is the firemen just saying, well, we can't let you in there, you know. It's too dangerous. Can't let you in there. Can't let you in there. I mean, I'm just, by this time, my wife brought me a jacket, thankfully, and I mean, I was soaked to the bone, but I'm just standing there watching and just waiting for them to let me in there to try to save something, try to save something. At this point, you don't know if you're going to be able to save anything. I mean, I have no idea. Finally, they said, you can go in and try to get some of your more important stuff. So we grabbed our server. This is my cousin. He grabbed my server. And, uh, you know, people are taking action shots of me. I mean, is that, is that a little weird? <laughs> and sending them to me. I think that's a little weird. Anyway, uh, you know, just anything that's super important. And also, by the way, the firemen are just tossing things out into the yard. Like, uh, I had a rifle that I had just bought. They tossed a rifle out there, which it ended up, it was in a case. It's okay. They tossed uh, my brand new Syrac out in the yard. It's, it's not as okay. Uh, you know, precision instrument, you know. It doesn't, it's not good to toss those things. Um, anyway, it's just a lot of real crazy weird stuff that happens in a deal like this. Uh, let me show y'all, you know how we are, how we dentists are about before and afters. So, I wasn't one of those guys that just snapped a lot of photos of my building before or anything, but I tried to find some pictures that matched up pretty good. And I took a lot, we did have a good many pictures of, of training days in our practice. So here's a, here's a before of a one-op that we had. Notice it's a nice pink chair from Knight. I believe it's an asepsis unit. Uh, this is after. Okay, so that's the, the roof falling in and everything burning. This is a hallway of one of the wings, you know, nice hallway. I had six ops in each wing, pretty much. Um, so this is the hallway after the fire. Okay? Just to give you some idea. A lot of the ops looked about like this. Just things turned over from, uh, from the roof caving in and just charcoal everywhere, you know. And so anyway, this, I'm going to give you guys just, uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is the post-op pictures of the office. This is Kim Hobson's desk. She spent so much time coaching from and trying to, uh, you know, trying to do, you know, make our practice better and everything and going over treatment plans. You know, this is the desk. And the Lord knows how many treatment plans and case acceptances we've had from that desk. That's uh, the waiting room. We had used to be really nice. There's an interesting, that's a dental chair I bought from Dr. Steve Deloach, who's uh, done some introducing for me this weekend. Uh, Steve sold me that chair. It was old when I, he, he sold that to me in 1999 or 2000 for 500 bucks. And I always said it was kind of ugly, but I wasn't going to replace it till it quit working. So I, I guess I'll replace it now. Um, this is that. Beautiful sterilization room I was so proud of. That was, uh, that was a real bummer. I mean, man, I love that sterilization room. Uh, this was a kid's room. The kid's room, you know, uh, how many of y'all have a kid's room? Interestingly enough, I only did a kid's room because I had so many ops. I mean, I had uh, plumbed out 14 or 15 or 16 ops. I don't even remember. I don't even want to think about it. But I had all those plumbed out. I didn't use them all. And so we took one, one room, made it into a kid's room. It was very popular, by the way. I would recommend, yeah, that's a takeaway for this weekend. If you have a general practice where you see a lot of families, man, that's a big plus for somebody to be able to have an area close to where they're getting their teeth cleaned or something like that where they can just bring their kids and turn them loose. I mean, that's, a, that's really a no-brainer. 
In fact, it's so much of a no-brainer that when I build my new practice back, I will make sure that I have a kid's area because it, it just makes a difference in sometimes families keeping their hygiene appointments and not keeping them. Uh, let's see, that's an op. That's one of the ops. That's my private office. Uh, you know, I used to, man, I had this great bookshelf full of books. They all got messed up. Um, I had uh, I had all my ties that I wore to last year's event. You know, I had, I, I, I'm not a big tie guy. I only own like, I own like four, I own four ties. All four of them were in this room, <laughs> right? Thank the Lord, I had one of my suits in there, and I'd taken it home, um, you know, and so... Uh, Actually, these shoes were in that room, and I was telling a buddy of mine uh, earlier who, in his previous life, used to sell shoes. He said, well, those are nice shoes. And I said, well, the funny thing about these shoes is uh, they were in a box in there, and the box burned up, and the shoes are fine. They don't even smell smoky. So, made in America. You know, what do they, what'd you say they were? Alan Edwards, is that the name of them, Pat? Uh, anyway, yeah, so yeah, they're good shoes, uh, they, you know. Uh, here is what the roof, pretty much the attic, you know, the attic space looked like from down below everywhere. Shows how the fire pretty much burned up the whole attic. Uh, this is my wall of color-coded bins. They all melted together. Now in the days following the fire when the insurance company finally turned me loose to go salvage through stuff, we would take these, um, these bins that were melted into a big heap and I would go to my, um, I have a warehouse, and I would go to the warehouse and get on the concrete, and we would just take hammers and chisels and bust them open and try to find some, maybe a metal instrument that I could clean up and sterilize to, to use. And we, hey, when we got back on our feet a few days later, there were several instruments that are hard. You know, some instruments you, you use a lot are just not that easy to call up and get immediately, you know. Now, even if you had all the money in the world, you can't just call up and get every instrument you want just boom immediately. And especially like ortho and stuff, I mean, that's, you know, we, we found a lot of instruments we could clean up and salvage in these bins. Not a lot, lot, but a few. Um, these are, you, any of you guys use uh, gun racks? Any of y'all use a gun rack? Remember old Scott Perkins, he used to do the gun rack stuff. These are some of my gun racks I had, they're full of guns. Um, that was a bummer. Man, I, he didn't even make those anymore. So they're, I guess, irreplaceable. This is also, if you ever have this happen, if you could have keys available where you could unlock the doors for the firemen, it's good, because if you don't, they delight in throwing bricks and big stones through your doors to get them open. Uh, also, big windows. They like throwing bricks through big windows. I'm serious, I found this out. We had these giant big uh, glass windows that in our upstairs part of one of the wings, and then, you know, they just... They threw bricks right through them when, uh, when probably would have been just as easy not to have. Uh, there's an op. This is interesting. This is a quote we had up in our meeting room. Um, the way a team plays as a whole determines its success. You may have the greatest bunch of, in bunch of individual stars in the world, but if they don't play together, the club won't be worth a dime. I think Lapita picked that quote out, didn't you? So we thought that was interesting, that... That one thing didn't burn up, you know, in the whole staff room. And you'll find it's interesting what burns up and what doesn't burn up. I mean, you could just never tell. Sometimes you'll have something that's basically not touched, and then sometimes you'll have something that looks like this. Everything's just melted together. This is, uh, this is the room upstairs of the second wing where I, you know, I'm a big backup guy. So, you know, I'd bought a new phone system, but there was nothing wrong with the phone system that I had, so I took a night, put it in a nice Tupperware container, put it right there. Uh, at one time, I had like 20 NSK cordless hand pieces. I bought some new models, but the old ones worked. I certainly could have used them, stuck them right there. Um, all my backup, everything, I had in this one room. And so if I had that to do over, I guess the moral of that story is don't put all your backups in the same place, okay? That's, uh, that's, that's, a, that's certainly a takeaway. And everything the fire doesn't get, it's interesting. There is um, like a, this soot that just covers everything. I mean, it penetrates and saturates everything. And your computers, you know, even a computer that looks okay, 
Uh, like I would, I took all the computers up to the uh, to my warehouse, and I would plug them in up there because when you, as soon as you cut them on, they just they just have that wretched smell come out of them. They just smell awful. Uh, so you had to do it somewhere like that or outdoors. Um, and I tried to get as much data off as I could. But what will happen is, as the computer runs, if they have this soot in them, a lot of times the soot will just short circuit the computer. So a lot of times I would have 20 or 30 minutes to salvage as much data as I could. And then you could just, the computer would be getting hot the whole time. The fans don't work, and this, it just quits working. So, um, so that's always, you know, something to think about. If you're in a situation like this, you don't, if, if you can salvage anything, it's not, rarely you salvage much that you're going to have this like it was. Um, hey, can, hey, Mindy, where are you at? Can you set me a bottle of water up here or something? So, what happens next? Um, a lot of confusion, a lot of fear. You're standing there in the rain, and before the building, before the firemen even leave, people start asking you a hundred questions. There's just questions just bombard you from every single direction. There are questions that I never even thought about. And, uh, and if I had had the foresight to think about the answers to these before I got asked, you know, it would have been so nice to have had all this already thought out before the fact. Because right then, it's really tough to make good decisions. I mean, that night, while you're standing there watching it burn, you're, you don't know. You, you know, some, some, some part of you thinks, hey, they're going to get this thing put out. We're going to get in here and clean it up in a couple of days, and I'll be seeing patients, you know, by the end of the week. Okay, that's part of you thinking that. And then part of you thinks, I wonder how much my insurance pays. You know, that's the thought that goes through your head. And part of you thinks, man, if my insurance pays enough, reckon I could just quit doing dentistry? I mean, I mean, all this stuff that goes through your head, I, you know, who knows? There's just so much uncertainty, it's crazy. Um, and I'll, as I'll show you later, obviously, I didn't have the luxury of having so much insurance. That's the, that's the case. And hopefully you guys can rectify that situation for yourselves. Um... And just to give you a little glimpse forward, and the stuff we'll cover, and I'll show you how we recovered, but we, we did eventually, I slept on it. By the next morning, you know, I was already kind of back to myself, thinking ahead, deciding, hey, we got to move forward, what do we have to do, here's the steps we have to do, you know, I was, I was already in moving forward mode. The night it burned, probably not. I was kind of in a bad place that night. Uh, let me tell you, just here on the front end, uh... We did miss three business days of work. I'll show you how we did that. So we, we lost our building completely. And we, did, we only lost three days that we actually had patients scheduled. I did have a couple of vacation days in there, but we didn't lose much. And then we go into a temporary location where, I'll show you, it's definitely not the ideal situation, but nine days into that temporary location, we were actually able to get back and hit our daily goal of $12,000 a day. That's our goal. And, uh, and so that was June. Now, June was a tough month because, I mean, it was tough, man. It was tough. We didn't hit 12000 every day. It was like a process. You'd just like do this and do this and do this and finally work your way up. So I told Kim, I said, now... We already had vacations planned and vacations scheduled, and I said, shoot, I mean, I mean, this is an awful situation, but I'm not going to let it ruin our vacation. So I took a week off in July, and we only worked, still working just three days a week. And I said, Kim, what would be a good goal for us, you know? Because, you know, I don't think our old goals apply anymore because we've just had such a tough time. Do you think we could do six figures in July? Just working, um, I guess what we were, just right around 10 days in July. And, you know, she said, well, it would be... It'd be tough, but maybe we could. And at this point, you know, we still only have just a few chairs, and it's not like you can just feel like you can just call up and order brand new everything, and where would you put it even if you had it? So uh, that at least gave us a goal and a mission. And as the month went on, it, got, it became obvious we were going to get close to that, but I didn't know if we were going to make it. But I really wanted to be able to tell you guys that we were able to meet that goal when I came up here. So I was watching, boy, that last day of July, I was watching that schedule all day long, and when we finally crossed over, I, uh, I took a screenshot of it. And so we did actually manage 
to get over that $100,000 mark on the last day of the month. So I can tell you guys that was a, an amazing challenge. And I'll show you, you probably don't understand how big of a challenge it was till you see what we had to work with. It was almost like doing, for the bulk of the month, it was about like doing dentistry if you go to a third world country and try to scratch it out like that. And I feel like this month we're already off and doing good. Our production is back up basically to pre-fire levels. And so I feel like from this point forward we're good, even with our temporary setup. Um, and like I said, we're building again, and, uh, and we're, we're moving forward. Uh, I'll give you a little perspective on, on the differences that I'm having to deal with right now. So this was a Google Earth shot of my practice. This is Google Earth of my practice before it burned. Okay, it's about 7,000 square feet. Part of it has two stories. Um, I think it's a great location. It's right next to McDonald's. It's right next to the local bank. Um, it's also right next to a cash tobacco store, but, you know, hey, it's, we're in the middle of Mississippi. Um, this is what we ended up having to move into just because I want something I could get into quickly. But you see that little building on the top part of the picture? So that was a nurse practitioner's office in a town called Blue Mountain, Mississippi. Now, it's about five miles from Ripley. It's not even in the city of Ripley, and it's smaller than Ripley. Um, obviously, patients can drive five miles, but we found some patients don't like to drive the extra five miles. And uh, look how many parking places I've got now. One, two, three, four, five. I've got five parking places. Now, I've got more than five staff members. Now, the good news is the bank right next door because they were, they were so gracious, they let my staff use the, the back side of their parking lot. So my staff and myself fill up the whole back side of the bank parking lot every single day, and we walk across the grass and go in the back door of the little nurse practitioner building with five parking spaces. Okay? Um, now, I think for us to go from 7,000 square feet, tw uh, 12 fully equipped ops, to a little bitty rinky-dink 2,000 square foot nurse practitioner office that we had to plumb, get temporary equipment into, a chair at a time over the course of a month or a month and a half, uh, and be able then, within the course of just one month, pick up and do our pre-fire production levels was a pretty good feat, okay? I, I think that was a pretty, pretty big deal. I, I, would think, I would think that I would hate to have to try to do that again. And I'm going to show you guys how that I was able to go through. And yesterday we talked about the four parts to every practice. This is how I was able to do that, okay? All right. So this is 12 steps to crisis recovery. And you guys are going to find in these 12 steps, hopefully, a lot of gems that you can take back and fix in your own practices. Maybe you already got all this situated. But I'd be surprised if you got every bit of it situated. So, number one. Because like I said, that night you're standing there watching this happen, or let's say you get a call in the middle of the night, boom, you have no practice. It's hard to take all that burden on yourself. So you really need to make sure that you have some sort of a crisis team ready to take some of the burden off you. Okay? Now in my case, I have got two team leaders I already had. I got Lapita, who you've met, and I've got Kim Hobson, who you've met. Now, Kim is my uh, team leader for my front office, and she handles all the policies and all the systems for the front office, and also all the, she's in charge of all the employees in the front office. And then Lapita, she's in charge of all the clinical activity. So one of the first things you got to do is get them on your team and get them going in the right direction and giving them stuff to do. Now, I tell you what, I didn't even know how comfortable... I should have told you I was going to do this before we did. Lapita, where's Kim at? How comfortable would you be in describing your state of mind immediately after the fire? Yeah, just tell them how it feels to be a staff person when you're really uncertain what the future holds. I don't even know what she's going to say. This could be terrible. <laughs> well, I mean, I was, I was pretty shaky. You know, I... I was full of fear, like you said. Okay, full of fear. I was scared. I mean, I had fear not only for myself, but for our, all of our employees. What was your fear? What was your primary fear? My primary fear 
Once even, even once I realized that you were going to get get us back up and no no not once you realized what was your primary fear before you knew anything my primary fear was you would just be like you know this might be a good time to retire just yeah, yeah. just take yeah yeah I'm sure there are a lot of people back in Ripley think that's what that I've got like a big sack of gold dropped on my head after this thing uh, yeah but uh you know and when you're I didn't even know how much insurance I had at that time but uh, uh so Kim's primarily you were worried that nobody was going to have a job. Exactly, yes. Do you think that's what everybody was worried about initially? I believe so, yes. Okay. Unemployment. Unemployment. That was, yeah, that was our biggest fear. Yeah, I actually had uh, two, two, two staff people file for unemployment before, uh, before I even had a chance to, to say, hey, look, I'm seriously not quitting. <laughs> you know, and I don't really blame them. I mean, I'm sure everybody's worried about it. You know, that's just the way it is. I mean, it's... I felt for everybody. And to be honest with you, one of the reasons that I wanted to get back going so fast was because, you know, hey, I, I have a great team. I think most of you guys would agree if you've seen them in these classes here. I've got a great team. I felt bad for them. I wanted them to have paychecks again. And, and I honestly, you know, even though I had a nice little uh, bit of money set aside for an emergency, you can't just keep paying out money when you're not earning any forever, right? I mean, that's impossible. So I had to get back to producing some level. So uh, what was it the next day? By the next day, we pretty much had decided to move in the direction of trying to find a place to work. Yeah, I think so. Within a day or two, for sure. Okay. All right. So that's good. So it was a lot of fear. Anything to add to that? Anybody else that lived through this experience? Lapita, you have anything to add to it? A lot of hurt. What's that mean? Eleven years of hard work gone. You know what I found interesting about that? My team took that stuff to heart worse than I did. You mean, you know, I had, I had a lot of, um, you know, I guess I had put, since 1999, I had put, I mean, I had planned every renovation. I did a lot of the carpentry myself. Um, you know, I put up, me and my cousin put up walls on the inside. I mean, there's a lot of memories of, you know, memories and stuff and blood, sweat, and tears. But I think my team... Took it worse than I did. I think they were. I think they were. Uh, was it because of the lack of stability? I mean, you you were you you know. Maybe, but I I think we just all have such a closeness and a commitment to that place. I, I mean, I could I I don't know what it's like to lose my home to a fire, but I just thought that had to be like the next worst thing. You know, it was like it's like our second home. So yeah. Okay. All right, well, see, that, and see I, this, I'm learning a lot up here. I just thought to ask these. I haven't even, you know what's crazy? I haven't even taken the time to ask them this until just now. But I'm glad to know that. I'm glad you felt like it was a second home. Um, so anyway, good. So uh, anything else to add about how everybody felt? Or is that nothing? I know Jackie wants to talk. You don't want to talk? Okay, okay, okay. Don't cry. All right. We still love you, Jackie. It's okay. All right, so you need a crisis team already. So I had Kim and Lapita, and they're hurting too, right? But by the next day, we grabbed them, and we're like, okay, look, we're moving forward. We've got to find a way to get this practice back to going. I don't know how it's going to be right now, but just understand, you've got to reach out. You've got to get all the troops together. Let them know we're not fading away into the distance. We're going to move forward. Um, number two, physical plant management. Now, if you have a disaster and you have an old building structure, or not, it's not an old building structure, but whatever building you're in. Uh, a friend of mine also recently had a flood. Uh, and Right, Dr. Miller? That's no fun either, right? Okay, so here's some stuff you think about. You need to secure the premises. While the firemen are there, nobody's going to loot anything or get away with anything, you know, but the firemen leave. And I found out the hard way. I mean, I thought in Ripley, everybody loved me. We asked some policemen if they would stand guard that night till we could get everything uh, out after the firemen left. And they said, that's not our job, Dr. Griffin. I'm like, come on, guys. Haven't I donated? How much have I donated to y'all's stuff over the years? And you give me that kind of answer? Uh, but yeah, the police, they, that's, uh, hey, hey, you know, we'll drive by a couple times, but it's not our deal. Um, you want to salvage as much as you can before it's too late, but it's tough if it's a total loss. You know, it's tough to salvage much of anything. One thing you have to think about, hey, the insurance companies 
they're not always like, it's not like that Allstate commercial where that guy with that deep voice comes and handles everything right away. Man, you have a claim that's big like this. Uh, they are, man, they're tough. They sent, this would be good. Y'all got those tickets in the room? Um, I want y'all to guess how many individual fire investigators my insurance company sent to Ripley, Mississippi to try to determine if it was really lightning or if it was something else that they didn't have to pay for. Wait. Huh? You're, you're closer than it. I haven't heard. Somebody shouted this out. Hey, who said 10? Okay, somebody said it before. I'm sorry, but I did hear her. Let's give her another ticket for a drawing. Because, yeah, they sent 10 people to investigate my claim, man. They thought, I don't know what they thought. I guess they thought I just wanted to burn my place down. I don't know what they were thinking. Or maybe they thought somebody didn't like, you know, I pulled a tooth on somebody that didn't like me or something. <laughs> that burn it down. I don't know what they were thinking, but anyway, after the 10th guy, they finally said, you know what? It was a lightning strike. Um, by then, of course, the trick is, the fireman fighting that thing, you got all this rubble laying in the floor. Well, the rubble's wet. Rubble is soaked, man, with all the firefighter water and whatever else they fight a fire with. So you can't, you're not allowed to touch that stuff till they get through investigating because they got to be able to see everything. You know, they're trying to figure out everything. Well, then finally they said, yes, it was a lightning strike. You can clear some of the rubble out. At this point, I thought, man, maybe we can, uh, we can dig the rubble out. Who knows? It may be okay. Maybe I can save a wing and start working out of that wing. Of course, we dug the rubble out, and uh, the floors were bucked. I had wooden floors throughout. I was really proud of them. They were original hardwood floors, and they were all bucked up, you know. And uh, so we tore that out, and under that... The plywood was kind of bad, and under that, the joists were wet. Some of them were starting to get mold on them, you know. And so at this point, I'm just like, man, this is just, we're just going to have to build a new one. Um, so, but until then, because look, if I'd, have, if I'd have messed around too much, if I'd have tried to save my floors or save something, the insurance company, I don't know this, but they very well could have come back and said, hey, you know, you messed with it so much, we can't do our investigation properly, and that probably would have been, been a big hassle. So you got to be conscious about that. Uh, the new building. You want to be sure that your team, your team leaders, your crisis team, whatever you want to call them, that uh, they evaluate as soon as they humanly possibly can, at least to come up with a preliminary plan. Now, once we knew we couldn't salvage a wing or anything on the old practice, we had to find a building. Okay, so I went around, I went to one nurse practitioner office that was empty in Ripley. It just wasn't going to work. I could only get three ops in there. Uh, I went to an old subway place, you know, all kind of problems with that. It was just like a 2,000 square foot open space with a kitchen, and it was on a slab, you know, so that, that's bad. It was just going to take too long to get up and going. I finally found this little place in Blue Mountain, Mississippi, uh, that was a nurse practitioner office, and I went in there and I said, you know what, I believe I can get five or six ops in here uh, with all the essential stuff. It would be tight, but I think I could, and I think I could get my practice back at least limping along on five or six ops. Uh, because, you know, I tell you one, of the, I, I wish I had taken a picture. Uh, I wish I had taken a picture of one of the saddest things that I found after the fire. I'd go back up to the practice, and, you know, even though it was on the front page of the paper and gossip spreads, it was all over Facebook and stuff like that, a fair number, a fair number of my patients, they, uh, they still would, like, had an appointment. They would come to the office, realize it was burned, and, uh, and then leave, you know? Uh, you know, even though you're trying to reach people, they just, that's the way it would happen. And so I'd go up there, and I would see, occasionally I would see just little appointment cards that for, their day, for their appointment that had been flicked into the, into the grass or the, the parking lot, you know. People that had actually driven up there to come to their appointment, realized it had burned, and just flipped their appointment card down. And you know, a lot of people even told me afterwards, they said, hey, we just assumed you were down for months. We just thought we'd better go find another dentist. You know, how does that make you feel? You're going through this? 
and then somebody tells you, well, we just thought we had to find another dentist. I mean, that's like hitting you in the gut. Um, that was awful. But the good news is we did have a lot of our systems in place to try to handle something. Because back, remember back to the flood, we'd put a lot of, we'd actually written down a lot of this stuff. And so we had a lot in place. We didn't have everything. But we had a lot where we could sort of, we at least had a framework where we could get going maybe a little bit faster than what we were supposed to. I say, uh, here's a tricky one. You know, where is, Na is Nashville Dental in the room? Anyone from Nashville Dental? They're out. They've been exhibiting. Boy, they were so helpful. They're my, you know, some people use Patterson or Shine or whatever. I use a company called Nashville Dental. I think I'm actually their most southern client. They dip down barely to Ripley, Mississippi. And, uh, and so they have always bought my equipment from them. Primarily because... You remember yesterday I was telling you about the bad associateship I had. Uh, the guy that I used to work with, I, I was always fearful that he was, he was such a, he was a big producer. And I was always scared he would do so much business with Patterson that if I went with Patterson, they would treat me like, you know, second fiddle because I was scared of that. So I found this company, Nashville Dental, and, and you know, ever since they've just treated me so good. Well, they, they actually rounded up some used, like, uh, carts. And I had some ortho chairs that I had purchased off Craigslist for, like, cheap. I mean, I got six ortho chairs for a 1000 bucks off Craigslist. And I said, I'm just going to stick them in uh, my warehouse. And then I ended up using three of them, you know, for ortho. I do a lot of ortho. In my 7,000-square-foot place, I use three of them. But I had three sitting in a warehouse. So Nashville Dental rounded me up three carts to use with those three ortho chairs. And they actually got them to Blue Mountain for me. Um, a local contractor, you know, we got the plumbing done. We got the, the, you know, the copper done for the compressed air and stuff like that. And all this is done in the course of about a week and a day. And we were at, you know, like I say, we only missed three actual scheduled working days through the whole process. Uh, IT. So think about how you might operate without computers. Anybody in here, everybody in here use computers, right? Have you ever thought about what would happen if you could not get a hold of your computer data if, like, the day came and you just couldn't get it? You know? That's freaky. That is freaky. Um, so if you have this happen, try to get your server to your, to your computer guy as soon as humanly possible. In my case, we did that. We got it up to Memphis. He cracked it open, tried to dry it. He uh, tried to turn it on. It turned on, but it would, wouldn't stay on long. And we, didn't, we were actually not able to salvage anything off that server. Uh, the good news, and I would encourage everybody to do this right now. Like, when you leave this lecture, is anybody in here, does anybody in here have online backup already? Who does not have online backup? Okay. Listen, I didn't have until 10 months ago. Ten months ago, I started paying. It's less than $100 a month. They back up all the data off my server every day, multiple times a day. If I had not done that, there, I wouldn't have known how to call a patient. We wouldn't have known how to tell people, hey, don't come for your appointment. The place burned. We're trying to get you a new appointment. You know, We wouldn't have been able to do anything. We wouldn't have been able to get our accounts receivable. Did you think of that? you got all this money that's out there owed to you, insurance claims here and there. Online backup is the way to go. Now... Your images, I found out this, the, you know, it takes a little while to get your images back uh, because they're too big. So the company was actually, my computer guy was able to download all my data from the Internet onto a temporary server so we actually could see our stuff, you know. And uh, another, hey, this is another, tr I just thought of this. Like, we use Dentrix. Who in here uses Dentrix? Okay. So you need to save your disks from not only your current version of Dentrix, but probably also two or three disks back, so when your computer guy, if this ever were to happen, they've actually, sometimes some of the modules, they've got to go back two or three disks and load, like, that Dentrix, then this Dentrix, then this Dentrix, and get you all the way up to the new one. So I didn't realize that. So we had to get a hold of Dentrix, and they had to get us the, actually, online downloads for the old Dentrix version so we could build it back up to, to be able to put our data on here. Um, then the company, they sent me a hard drive that had all my images on there. Now, it still took a few days. Um, you, you've got to come up with some kind of a plan, too, for
for an office with fewer computers. Because when you start back, let's say the insurance company hadn't paid you. Like, the insurance company hadn't paid me a dime yet on contents at all. And so I hate to go out and spend $25,000 on computers yet. So we're just getting by on just a few computers. And I'll show you how we're doing that. But have a plan for how that you could get by for fewer computers if you had to. And one of the coolest things we've found out, and I didn't even realize, is you can pretty much run your practice off iPads for your clinical ops if you have to. All right? I didn't know that, but like there's software now that you can view your x-rays on an iPad. And so you can do your x-rays, and you can do your intro or camera shots on an iPad. And, uh, and then you can just use a few centrally located computers that they can enter data into in those areas, but you do not have to have a computer for every op, you know. It's nice, but you don't have to have it. Uh, X-ray in every room. You don't have to have that, I learned. So now we just have one room where we take all of our X-rays. And you know what? It hadn't been that bad. Uh, we've got one wall-mounted X-ray in there, you know, for PAs and stuff. We got a new pan. Now, I will say, this new pan is totally awesome. I mean, I had a digital pan before, and I thought the image quality was okay, but not that great. Boy, this thing, it's a whiz-bang gadget right here. I mean, your images are crystal clear, and you can upgrade it to 3D. Dr. Brady, I know you like that. Uh, not necessarily, but uh, you can upgrade I didn't upgrade it, but you can. You can also put a Ceph on it. I'm tickled to death. Look at this chair right here. I mean, look, I ain't wasting anything. My mom got me this about 10 years ago for a present. It's a, a, like a 1800s dental chair. She found it at an antique store. And she, and hey, guess what? You can, you can raise the seat up like this, <laughs> right? You can adjust, you can crank the neck thing. You can adjust it. We can sit people in there all day long and take x-rays. Doesn't hurt a thing in the world, you know? And we're getting along just fine for now with that. Uh, patient privacy security. This is a tricky one. You know, I don't even know all the 100% laws on HIPAA, but you've got to assume there's laws on stuff like this. Uh, if you have a situation where, like, your file room burns like mine, you've got a problem because, you know, like the door that used to go into the room that locked is now broken down by the fireman. So some of the charts in there are burned. Some are not burned. I mean, you know how it is. There's pieces of paper with people's names on it that's fine. Some are smoky. Some are singed. Some are burned. But most of them are, you know, you can read stuff on them if you had to. You know, somebody could do some damage with them probably. So you got to figure out what to do. The night of the fire, we decided our only action after the fireman left was to, we had to run and we grabbed some big pieces of plywood that I already had, I actually have, you know, I have a warehouse, so I have stuff like this kind of just sitting around just in case. So we went to the warehouse, grabbed some big pieces of plywood, and screwed some pieces of plywood in where the doors had been. So if nothing else, at least we've got some privacy for those records until the insurance company would give me the, the clearance to go in and remove them safely uh, so it didn't interfere with their investigation. Something you don't think about. But it's always good to have a few pieces of plywood just sitting around somewhere. You've got to secure them. If you're, how, many, how many people in here are totally paperless? So you don't have anything that somebody could see. That's good. I mean, that's the best. I have always found it completely difficult to do away with every piece of paper because of the way we operate, and I guess probably the, the way we practice. We just I like to make, when I'm doing a treatment presentation, I like to have something that I can sort of just glance at while I'm talking to the patient back and forth without having to do a lot of pulling up because I feel like it interferes with my communication skills. Um, so I've just always got to have that orange card. But I'll show you in a minute how we decided we made the orange card actually. Now the orange card is our patient chart. We no longer have charts. So we decided we squeezed every piece of pertinent information onto an orange card, enlarged it slightly, um, and I'll show you one in a minute. And then everything else, we're now scanning into the computers, stuff that I feel like is not so important that I need to be able to glance at it while I'm talking to them. Business continuity. Now, this is important to go ahead and just have these thoughts. Where might I go if I woke up tomorrow and I could not go to my dental practice? Where might I go to be able to continue to work? Okay, it might be that you've got a friend that's a dentist who would lend you a couple of rooms. 
But it's always good to have that conversation ahead of time, you know, just, just, just in case. Um, I found it very interesting when this happened to me that I got phone calls from all over the area. And um, there's a town 25 miles south of Ripley called New Albany, Mississippi. A dentist from there called me up and offered me his office. Uh, he said, you can have three ops when I'm there, and on Thursdays and Fridays you can have as many as you want. A guy from Corinth, Mississippi, which is about 30 miles away, called up, said the same thing. Well, the five dentists in Ripley, none of them called me to offer that. Now, I will say, one of them, I did call and say, hey, Doctor, is there any way I could just use a couple ops for a couple of days while we get our temporary office done? And he was gracious enough to let me use his place. I never actually, we got mother and going so fast, I never had to use it. But he was very gracious in offering that to me. But it would have been nice if I had done the legwork and thought this through before it ever happened. Um, who is going to work? I got news for you. If this happens to you and you have whatever, I, I don't even know how many I had. Let's say I had... 12 employees at the old place, 7,000 square feet. You go to 2,000 square feet, I mean, you just do not have room for all of them. It's impossible. You're going to have to make some tough decisions about who you can keep and who you can't keep. And, um, and you also can think about stuff like part-time. Maybe some people can go part-time for a while. Maybe they're gonna, they can cut back or whatever, but you need to think about this stuff beforehand. What procedures will we offer? Well, you know, Dr. Brady, my implant drill and motor burned up. So we didn't have, you know, and I had some people down for implants the next couple of weeks. Well, we basically, I had to make a decision. Do I want to focus on trying to just keep all my bread and butter stuff coming in like as normal as possible? And just so, so I did decide, hey, I'm just going to wait on the implants until we get a little bit things more normal. Also, my CIREC. It's gone, so I'm not in any hurry to order another Cirac. Uh, you know, those things are pretty expensive if you, have, if you have one. Who's all got one of those? I love it, but it's really expensive. That's kind of the way I feel about it. Uh, and it's not a necessity. And that, let me show you this. So I was so proud when I found that nurse practitioner's office that uh, the hospital owned it. So I thought, well, that'll be great. So I called up my uncle who was on the hospital board, and he said, yeah. He said, tell you what, we've got to have the signature of every board member. But we'll, he said, I think that won't be a problem. So like within a few hours, he called back and said, okay, i got every board member's signature. He said, now, here's the deal. The hospital owns it, so they're bound by federal law to rent it to you at the rate at which is stated in, this, in their law that you've got to be rented at this particular. It's the same rate that all the doctors in Ripley, Mississippi pay. I said, well, fine, that should be fine, because everything's cheaper in Ripley, Mississippi. So anyway, we make our plans. We even go down there. We, we, uh, we, we talk to the administrator. He said, go ahead, you can start doing some wiring and stuff. And, he, and so we'd actually started all that. And then uh, my dad, I was at my basement at my desk working one, one of the mornings, and my dad, uh, he, he, worked, he still works at a bank, and, and so... They had the lawyer for the bank is the same lawyer for the hospital, and the lawyer for the kid brought my dad the contract. So my dad brings it to me, and he said, uh, he said, uh, you 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 need to look at this contract. It, this thing you may not like this. And so I said, what? He said, well, he said they tell me they've got. It. He said this is the rate they've got to charge you, or they can't rent it to you legally. And it uh, the lease said uh, I would owe them twelve thousand four hundred and two dollars and 75 cents per month for 2,000 square feet with five parking places in Blue Mountain, Mississippi, population 714. <laughs> and so I'm freaking out because now I'm like, okay, we've already got all this and we think we can be open in a day or two in Blue Mountain and now i got to back up. we got to go try to find another place because now nowhere's going to be... Man, you could buy this building for a year's rent <laughs> or less. I think you could buy it for $100,000. And so anyway, I said, Dad, I said, it's just got to be something wrong here. 
I said, uh, can you call the lawyer and just tell him to double check, please? So he then then dad came back about 15 minutes later and he was he could tell by the look on his face. He was in a lot better mood. And he said, you won't believe this. He said, I was talking to the lawyer and he said, you know what, Joe? I put that decimal in the wrong spot. <laughs> it's going to be 1,200 and whatever dollars a month. And I said, who ever heard of a lawyer putting a decimal in the wrong spot? Uh, but anyway, I'm in Mississippi. But, uh, but so anyway, that's better, right? A thousand bucks a month, that's better. That's better. So uh, communications. Everybody here, you probably already have this. Who already has like a phone tree, chain of command, communications thing if something crazy happened? I know you do if you live in a place that has snow, right? Or are you like the doctors that say, by gosh, if I can get to the office, you better get there too or you're fired. Is that what you say? <laughs> I know it never snows in New Mexico, right? Um, well, that's okay if you don't have it for the snow days, but I would encourage you to go ahead and get some sort of chain of communication going just in case of an emergency, right? Okay. How are you going to reach your patients? Now, normally, I would have said, well, we will go ahead and we will, uh, A, hopefully our server will start up, and we'll reach them that way. And, and B, we'll, we always have somebody carry three days of the schedule home, just in case, we'll go to that next. Well, somehow along the way, that person didn't have three copies of the schedule, a server wouldn't work. Well, guess where my information was? I didn't even realize. So how many of you that how many of y'all that have Dentrix have used have done signed up for their app? Did you realize that it puts your uh, like your appointments in the cloud? I was I didn't realize that. That is a very good thing, is it not? <laughs> it's very good. So if your practice management software has an application that will upload your appointment book. That is something you should check on and do immediately. Because that might be the only way you can reach your people. And like I said, it's always a good idea for someone on your staff to take home three printed copies of the schedule in their purse just in case of an emergency. Okay? That's just a good idea. And I think now there's some online software. I think there's a company called Curve Dental I'm super interested in. I mean, I'm way too invested in Dentrix at this point to change. But that sounds really cool to me to have all of your stuff online now after what I've been through. And uh, it'd be a lot cheaper, too, because you don't have to buy a server, right? If you have all your software online, you don't have to buy a server. The reason I'm scared of that is because I have some applications that do that, and occasionally they go down for maintenance and stuff, and so I don't ever want to be without my patient information. But I think it's worth looking into. Uh, okay, here's a good one. If you no longer had a phone in your practice, if you no longer had a phone in your practice, how are you going to get a phone call? Have you guys thought about that one? Because you know people are going to call your number. Um, you say, well, I'll just forward the number. Okay, do you all know the process for forwarding your phone right now? You pick up the phone, and you dial star whatever, and you dial the number you want to forward it to. Well, what if you can't pick up a phone and all the wires from the phone company going into your building are melted together? How are you going to forward it? So you need to think about that. Everyone should probably have a phone person that they are go to, you know, that you buy your phone system from. That's a go-to guy. And and uh, they, by the way, they can go into the boxes and they can forward phones that way because they have little things they can plug into the box coming off, uh, like mine comes off a telephone pole, they can plug it in at the pole, and they can forward it from there. But you need to think about this stuff, you know? If everything's burnt up, you can't. All right, this is my favorite part of the whole discussion, is uh, insurance companies. They're going to send all kinds of consultants to you if some emergency happens. And you just have to smile and be nice to them and whatever. Uh, most of them are nice guys, just hardworking guys, and they're not even allowed to talk to you about your claim. They're just there to collect information. Um, I know that 
the, uh, the first guy that checked all my equipment, he saw the Syriac, and, uh, and, he, uh, and he said, well, I think that thing's probably broken. And I said, well, it looks broken to me. Uh, but whatever you say. So he put it down on his list as being something that they would, you know, total loss. So then the insurance adjuster realized that I had just taken out, when I bought it, you know, I said, man, I don't feel comfortable having a piece of equipment like this in my office without a separate policy for it. So I had taken out a separate $150,000 rider just for the CIREC, separate from the rest of the claim. And uh, so then the adjuster, after that first guy came, he calls up and said, hey, Dr. Griffin, uh, you've got a separate rider for that CIREC piece of machinery. And I said, yeah, yeah, I thought you guys knew that. You mean, you're the insurance company. He said, ooh, I didn't notice that. So anyway, then they send another guy out from Atlanta, Georgia, it comes and looks at it. He flies into Ripley. He calls me. I meet him at Walmart. We drive to my warehouse. He goes in. He looks at it. He goes, man, that thing looks broke. <laughs> he said, uh, and he's a medical specialist, you know. And he said, uh, let's plug it in. He said, we can't hurt it any worse than what it looks like. So we plug it in. It wouldn't cut on. He said, yeah, this thing's broke. Uh, he said, Tell you what, it's going to take me about five minutes. He said, i got to take some pictures and samples just to make the insurance company happy, but I'll be in and out of here in no time. So they, they, the insurance companies, they're, they're so thorough, you know. They send a guy twice to look at something to make sure it's broke, you know. But anyway, uh, inspectors. Now this is, uh, you know, hey, how about your city? We've got pretty good inspectors, really. They're not too, too particular, but... But, you know, you've got inspectors. I mean, they're going to inspect everything. When something like this happens, they're going to inspect to make sure the site's safe. Uh, if you get ready to rebuild or, or repair, you have to get licenses. And I mean, it's just, it's just a big old rigmarole. And so you need to think about stuff like my building was, was in the floodplain because the original structure that I bought was in the floodplain. You saw those pictures of the flood, right? It was in the floodplain. And so... Once we made the decision to knock it all the way down, then I have to go through all this stuff. We have to raise the, the building site up with dirt so it's no longer in the flood plain. And so you have to think about stuff like that uh, if you're going to rebuild. Demolition, you know. you got to think about demolition. Uh, who are you going to get to demolish your place? Uh, insurance company may tell you it doesn't matter who does it, and then the city may tell you something else, and it's just a big old hassle. Uh, repairs, you know, repairs are, if you're going to try to repair something that's been damaged, you got to make sure that you cross every T and dot every I, because uh, once again, the insurance company is always looking for a reason probably not to pay you. Uh, whether you're going to do a reconstruction or a new construction, uh, it probably would be wise to hire somebody to help you with this kind of stuff, but I'm a do-it-yourself for you know, so I like to do it all myself. Uh, but just, if nothing else, get a point man. Like, my, my maintenance guy is a licensed plumber and electrician and also a contractor. And so he is pretty much handling everything for me. You can't make every decision, so maybe if you could get someone like this, it would be very valuable. Just already know before it happens, who would I get to be my point man in all this? And then go ahead and maybe have that conversation. Uh, okay, for your insurance policy. Now, this is where I think you guys are going to be on the phone as soon as I get through this section. How many of you guys know right now where your complete policy is? The whole thing. Okay. Three people out of this gigantic room of 200. Um, I didn't know where mine was. I'll just be honest with you. So then, after it burns, the insurance agent from Ripley that sold me the policy. Now, he was like the Allstate guy. He did show up in the rain, said, hey, I'm going to do all I can to help you. The next day, he had printed off about 50 pages. And uh, well, I'm looking at it, and I'm like, man, this doesn't make sense. And so uh, he said, well, it's not your whole policy. To get your whole policy, you've actually got to make a formal request to your insurance company, but they probably sent you one at some time or another through one of your renewals. And so... Uh, I had it somewhere, I just didn't know where it was, and so then I called my lawyer, uh, and he said, well, he said, you know, when they're investigating, if you request your whole policy, sometimes that might throw up a red flag, and they're going to think 
that you're just trying to really mess them over, you know, with every possible way you could. And so you just don't know what to do. Luckily, I went and I dug through, I had a document box of important documents I'd kept, and I finally dug around until I found my whole policy. Now, the whole policy is different than what the agent gave me. The whole policy is like yay thick, you know. It's, it's like front and back, 100 and something pages. Uh, and that is very, uh, is very complicated, too. Uh, first thing you need to make sure of is know your limits, Okay, now this is actually, I'm just showing you my actual limits on my policy. I had $381,000 on building. Now, after, just recently I found out it was, uh, I don't know what it would be appraised at, the insurance company said that in their estimation it would cost $500,000 to repair it. So if I, it would cost $500,000 to repair it, and my point man backed, me, backed him up on that and said, yeah, that's probably about right and I only had $381,000 worth of insurance, what in the world was I thinking, you know? Was it just that I was too lazy to figure out what my building was actually worth? I think what happened is that in 1999, I bought a policy, and every year it increased a little bit, and even when I did the additions, and even after the flood, I, after the flood, I went back. Before the flood, it was like 290000 After the flood, I went back and bumped it up to that. But apparently, I was too lazy or something to check and see what would it cost if I had to rebuild this thing. Because where I live, I don't know what the numbers are when you live, but where I live, commercial buildings are about $100 a square foot. So 7,000 square feet times 100, obviously I didn't have enough insurance. So everybody check that. Um, now, contents, business per personal property, I had 236000 after the insurance company got through with their totaling up everything, their numbers show that if I were to replace all the equipment that I lost, it would take $900,000. Okay? Now, like I said, I had duplicates of a lot of stuff. I had triplicates of some things, and I had them all stored in the same place. It all melted. Uh, so... I'm able to function without all those backups, but over the years, you know, I, I mean, I felt I had stuff I would carry to charitable stuff, you know, and um, stuff that I, I could use, but it just wasn't the best. You know how it is. You'll buy something you like, and you'll have something old, and you just say, well, I could use it if I had to. So, I mean, I had all that, so that counts in that 900000 But obviously, I had nowhere near enough insurance on that. So everybody, pay attention and check your limits. All right, and also a term I learned very much is replacement cost versus actual cash value. Now, replacement cost is what I had, thank goodness. Not that it really matters with the limits I had. But um, if you bought a dental chair in 2005 for 20 grand, and you had replacement, if you had actual cash value insurance, they might pay you 5000 for it. You know, they would depreciate it, and so that's about what it's worth. If you bought the same chair for twenty grand in 2005 and you had replacement costs, they might pay you 25000 for the new model, 2013. And so if I'd had enough coverage, I'd be getting all brand new ADEC dental chairs, you know, every one of them. Uh, so that's something you need to pay attention to. I've talked to a few people just throwing this out, and some, some dentists even have actual cash value policies. And it's just, you got to be careful. Uh, limits. You know, there's... These things, like I said, man, this thing's like 100 pages thick. Limits are a big, they're confusing. Uh, if, it says at the like, if it says at the bottom of a big paragraph that the payments made under this coverage extension are in addition to the applicable limits, then they'll pay the limit, and then they'll pay you, who knows, they might pay up to another 25000 like in this, this case is for valuable documents. So I'm hoping that I get some money extra over my limits for my patient records that I have to replace, uh, even though I'm not replacing them 100%. But that's if it's over. Now, sometimes it says they have, and then they have little other things. The most we'll pay for this coverage extension is 2500 bucks. you know. So that's, you know, sometimes it says that. Sometimes it says language that, that will say, we'll pay this extra, but we're not going to pay a dime over your limit. So if you went over your limit anyway, it doesn't matter what you lost on this extension, you're not going to get any more money. So this is why you need that original policy. 
Uh, this is what everybody in the room needs to pay attention to. Okay? You better write this one down. And maybe, now I hadn't seen it yet, but maybe this is going to be the thing that saves my bacon on this whole deal. Is I had a writer that I had bought extra that was for uh, loss of business income slash extra expense. Now, does anybody in here already know that you have that? A couple of you over here, a couple of you over there. Uh, and, and also, our gentleman in the back, Dr. Miller, who had the flood this year, he had it. Now, he has given me some encouragement because I said today, this morning, I said, hey, you had that same insurance I had. Did they really pay you what you thought they owed you or do you think that they really didn't? And he said he thought they paid about 95% of what they really owed him. So I'm hoping that this really saves the day. The, these things usually have language that says they will pay your actual loss for 12 consecutive months. So that means, theoretically, that if my average is $150,000 a month and I make $100,000 during one of the 12 months after the fire, that they'll cut me a check for $50,000, theoretically, theoretically. Now, like I said, I haven't got the money yet, but I'm encouraged that that's actually going to happen. Not, uh, not everyone has this on their policy. Not every, uh, most people don't have it. I'm lucky that I had it. I don't even know that I knew for sure that I had it until this happened. Uh, here's another very important thing. If you have this insurance, okay? So how many of y'all actually own your own building? Okay, a lot of you. How many of you own the building in your personal name? How many of you own the building in the name of a real estate company? Like an LLC or a partnership or something. A few of you. As do I. So, when, you, when, when like an LLC or a PA or an FLP or whatever entity owns your practice besides just you as a solo individual guy, there's a, there's a part of the policy that has this uh, occupancy code. And so if it's rated dental office, then that's where the, the insurance company will request the, the money information for your dental practice to figure out your business income loss, right? Some people get in trouble because they get incorporated and then maybe they own a bigger building and they have their dental practice and they maybe rent a space to someone else, a veterinarian, a person that does nails, whatever. You got this big building, right? If that's the case, and your occupancy code is rated as some sort of a rental type business, then they're only going to pay your business income loss on the rental payments that the, all, the, all the companies that rent in that building pay into that, in, into that LLC or entity. So you got to be real careful about that. So I got lucky once again because mine, I, I'm the only person, I, I am the only entity in that building. So I got lucky. If I had rented space in there uh, to another company or something, I could have been in trouble. I might not have got, I might have got paid only the rental checks that weren't coming in instead of the actual dental practice income loss. Okay? So that's very, very important. All right. So hopefully everybody make that phone call. Um, legal. Legal. Okay. What can I say about insurance companies that you guys don't already think, right? Uh, you very well may have to get a lawyer to deal with your insurance company. I, I've only talked to a lawyer. We haven't gotten any kind of nastiness or serious or anything because so far the insurance company hasn't treated me poorly. They just haven't paid me yet. Um, uh, so... Uh, so yeah, but I think you really already, you kind of want to know who your lawyer's going to be if you have to do something. Uh, legal, you're going to have to work with the city on building codes. You're going to have to work possibly with the government on floodplain, if you're like me, stuff like that. Who knows what else you might need a lawyer for. Just go ahead and figure out right now who your lawyer is going to be if and when you have to call in a lawyer on, um, on something like this. Okay, HR, employee retention. So somebody has got to get the word out there pretty quick and say, hey, look, guys, we're getting back to work. 
we want you to stay. Or somebody's got to have the tough conversation and say, hey, look, uh, we love you, but we don't have space for you right now. Don't go too far, but we're, we're not going to be able to keep you right now. Okay? So, you know, usually that's your crisis team, but somebody's got to get in there and, 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 and cinch up the people that are going to stay with you through all this tough time. Uh, you know, if, there's, if there are people, let's say somebody that you, you like them, you want them to be able to get their unemployment. Uh, you know, do you want them to be able to file for unemployment and get it because of this situation? Try to go ahead and have that figured out who in your office could help them with that to get, make sure they get their money as quickly as possible. You hate for somebody just to have a ruined, uh, a ruined life because they didn't get money that they absolutely had to have quickly. You know, you feel really guilty about it. Uh, Reclassification to part-time, you know, that's, that's not a big deal. Sometimes people are glad to go part-time for a little while. You know, you might be surprised. Some people, that's a tough one. Some people might have to, you know, take a little cut in pay for a little while. Um, most of us dentists in here, we'd hate to do something like that, especially to our good people. But at some point, you can't, until you get paid by the insurance, you can't just keep paying your own money forever. Uh, I told my people when it happened, I thought, you know, after we, we did have to tell a few, I think like three people originally that I wouldn't be able to hire them back. And I said, uh, I said, look, as long as I can stand it, we're going to freeze your pay and, and your pay will not go down. Because we, we have a lot of bonuses and commissions and stuff we work off of. And I just said, look, as long as I can stand it, we're going to leave your pay where it is. And so that's what we've done. Uh, but I'll be honest with you, since it happened May 21st and we're still waiting on a check, you know, it's, it's not most fun. That's one reason why I was so proud we could do uh, six-figure production in July. Uh, retention. Some people are just not going to like the situation. Best, you know, you know, you might be shocked. You might have an employee that you can't believe it, but they just come to you after this and they say, look, it's too stressful. Uh, you know, I just, I can't, I can't handle it. I just can't do this. So, uh, you need to have somebody that's willing, if it's not you, to have these tough conversations. Uh, finances. I mean, the best thing you can do for any situation is have some money in the bank, right? I mean, money in the bank will solve a lot of problems. Uh, the worst thing that could possibly happen in a case like this, and I think where a lot of people get in trouble, and insurance companies probably know this, and that's why they drag these payments out, is if you, let's say you owed a lot of money, and you didn't have a lot of cash on hand, and you had a lot of payroll, and you had a lot of this and a lot of that, a lot of bills. Let's say you got a high lifestyle. You got a lot of bills, man. Big rent, big country club payments, big everything. Well, the, you might be tempted to settle for less than what you might could get if you're really, really in need of money. Uh, one of the first things that I did was I went to the bank, and I took out a $100,000 line of credit. I had a I had enough CDs in the bank. I just put that up against it. And I have yet to have to draw off of that, luckily. But, you know, that money was there just in case of mercy just to tide us over. So having that kind of stuff lined up. Now, hey, look, you go to the bank. I mean, most people have, a, most of us have a good relationship with their bank, right? Because we make pretty good income. But even me still, uh, they said, hey, Doc, what are you going to use on, for collateral on that line of credit? Uh, you know, so you got to have something. So it's good to have something you know you already know what your collateral is going to be if you want if you have to do something like that. Um, Short-term loans, line of credit, etc. That's what we just talked about. Equipment leases. Now this is an interesting one. I have um, once again, I'm not giving y'all legal advice. I'm just telling you my personal experience. Did you know that when you have that? Business income loss insurance. Uh, some insurance, everybody's may not be the same as mine, but in my particular case, they will pay 100% of any lease payments that I make on equipment at a temporary location, and they're fine with me purchasing that equipment personally when I move back to the other building. So I just realized, as long as there's somewhere to put it, so I just, I, I was like, and I, I actually called the adjuster myself, and I said, hey, look, so you're telling me that I can get four brand new 8-8 dental chairs because I have four ops I can put in up here at this temporary place. I can lease them for whatever term. You guys will make the 100% of the lease payment, 
for 12 months, because it was only for the first 12 months, and then at the end of that 12 months, I can do what I want to? And he said, well, hey, after 12 months, it's none of our business. He said, if you want to finish your lease out with them, turn it back into them, fine. If you want to finish your lease out, pay them for what it's worth depreciated. I mean, it's, your, it's not our business, Doc. It's all your business. So theoretically, in a case like that, with that particular rider on your insurance, you can lease some nice equipment and then basically get it at a very reduced fee at the end of your lease term. Uh, so that's going to help out a whole lot too, right? So that's something to think about. Leasing equipment may be the way to go if you run into this kind of situation. And you can purchase it at the end of it. Uh, construction loans. Be sure you, you know, be sure you get it. How many in here have built a building and stayed under their projected budget? So how, how about a house? Who's built a house recently? Do you just keep adding on stuff, adding on? I mean, I personally know... Uh, I'm already thinking about putting, like, real stone in the waiting room and all this stuff. I said I swore I wouldn't do it, but now that I'm starting to pick out my new building stuff, I mean, I know I'm going to go over. So make sure you got enough money for that. Um, and just understand, any time you're dealing with insurance like this, you're just not going to get that much very quickly. Okay, operations management. So here's what we were able to do in our temporary location. Clinical procedures, all right? What saved the day? So where's Lapita? So here's the deal with Lapita, and she told me this saved her life. So we, we don't have, you know, everything's pretty much gone. And you don't think about everything being gone until it's gone, right? And so you think, well, we got to start back over. How are we going to do that? Well, the good news is a couple of years ago, a couple of years, well, after the flood, Started before the flood, but after the flood, then everybody in here. So this is a complete office policy book that has every system and every policy and every even simple things like how to set up every procedure, job descriptions, standard offering procedures of every kind, workflow choreography, everything is in this book, right? So basically, we take this book, then we take... Uh, we saved some templates. I told you all yesterday, these things won't burn. I mean, they're like amazing. Uh, who else has got some of these in their practice? You got that quarter-inch seal, edge seal lamination? Man, this stuff is unbelievable. So all these made it through the fire. So we had enough to get one set for the whole office. So we, we took the templates, and we took our checklists, and Lapita was able to take those two things, and now she knows exactly what she's got to order to, uh, uh, along with this book, and she now can piece together and just very rapidly reorder every single item that she needed for us to be able to complete our stuff, right? So if you don't have something like that, I'm just guessing. Lapita, how long would it have taken you to have gotten the right stuff ordered where we could have actually done a procedure correctly if you hadn't had that stuff to work with? Right, so that's what, she's, what she says is exactly right. Because if you, if you don't have that, and you try to start over, you'll be doing a procedure, and you'll ask for something, and then everybody will realize, oh, well, we don't have that. Well, hopefully it's nothing that's got to be, you know. Like, okay, here's one thing we forgot, is I'm getting ready to do, um, I'm bad, if somebody breaks a tooth, you know, and if, I, if they don't want to, if they, if they, like if somebody breaks a tooth, it's not hurting, it's not abscessed, and I get this a lot. They say, well, just pull it. And I'm like, man, I'm not pulling that tooth. Um, so a lot of times I'll take some glass on them or like some key tack and just squeeze it in there and say, look, let's just let it ride a little while, and then we'll decide what to do about it. Okay? So I mean, one of the first days I do remember, uh, I said, hey, run me some key tack. So somebody goes in there, and they're, they're, you know, it has to run in that wiggle bug, so they're shaking the key tack up. So then guess what? It runs. We don't have a gun to put it in because the gun was in the sterilization room that melted everything. So then I'm like, huh, okay, well, let's pull it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, you got to think about that stuff. But if you've already got everything written down in this book or if you have the templates or if you have the checklist, you can take those and you can have a perfect procedure done just as soon as that order gets in from Nashville Dental or Patterson or whoever. 
Uh, who, who else hygienist in the room? Okay. Imagine. Imagine that tomorrow you had to go to work with an ortho chair, a cart, a seven and a half foot wide operatory, and over to the right, does anyone know what that is? It's a stainless steel floor lamp from Home Depot for $32.96. All right, how many hygienists would just cherish going to work tomorrow for that? Huh? Okay. But hey, we did it. We're doing it. We're doing it for now. I've got these other packages ordered. Come on, Nashville Dental. Get them to me. But... uh. We're doing it, guys. It's okay. You can survive. I can promise you. Pat Clark, where are you at? Where's he at? Pat Clark, would you like to have this set up the next time you go to Africa to do charity dentistry? Okay. All right. Yes, it can be done. Dr. Aaron Elliott, who's not here right now, would love to have this in Honduras. I would have loved to have had this the last time I went to Mexico. It can be done. Now, let me tell you, I told you guys about the iPads, right? Um, so here's this. Here's the hygienist, Holly. Is she in the room? She's not in the room? Holly's actually here this weekend. She came up to get her CE. She actually, uh, she has got a smile on her face because she is super happy about having, having this nice operatory to work out of. But so, it's not, so here's the deal. So we used to, everybody's op had a computer, right? Had a computer, a monitor, and blah, 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 blah. So now, back in that x-ray room, the computer that we have, the laptop that takes the x-rays, is the only computer now that we have for the clinical staff to go enter stuff into. So what we'll do is we'll take an x-ray, we'll pull up the x-ray on the iPad, which, by the way, that works really good. I may still use iPads a lot when we get rebuilt in my new place. And they're having to go old school with their perio charting and uh, charting of everything on a piece of paper and a pen. And so then once they're through with the patient, they go back up, they, they take turns getting on that computer and entering all that stuff in the computer, okay? Super big time, inconvenient, old school, but it can be done for the time being. It can be done. Um, I am serious about the iPads, though. That's really cool. I may seriously figure out a way to do that all the time because it is nothing. You can take that thing and you can hold it right in front of the patient. You know you can make those teeth big. and I mean, it's really cool. So think about that. How many people in here are already using iPads for stuff like that? A cup? One? You like it too? You think it's neat? I think it's really neat. Operative. Here's a oral surgery beginning setup. Uh, now, I will say, I have more than the stainless steel floor lamp. I do have a headlight on my loops. So... I'm not totally third world because I'm not crazy. I mean, I don't want to screw up and do something stupid and get sued in the interim. But hey, got a headlight on your glasses? You're fine. You don't have to have a light on your chair, if, you know, for the time being. Uh, the environment. How are we gonna? How did the environment affect how we were able to do this? Let's show how we got. So, who in here already has got the color coded bins in their office? All right, over here, Dr. Rhodes. He's going to talk about it tomorrow. It made a big difference for his practice. Who over here? Dr. Holman, he's got it. Um, you like them? Makes everything easier, right? Uh, some people have modified versions of it. Let me show you all how we got it. So this is our new wall. I have people tell me all the time, well, Dr. Griffin, I know these color-coded bins in your practice. Of course, they work great at your practice. We just don't have anywhere to put them. Well, come on, guys. This is what I walked into. This wall is about what is it, six feet, seven feet at the most, just a wall. And so we laid it out, got everything put together, and boom, from a Friday to a Tuesday, we turned this into this, this into this. I mean, I did all, I'm out there just like them, I'm out there with a screwdriver taking the the, do the cabinet doors off, you know, so we could fit stuff up, up high. And uh, it's not convenient, but it's not, it's, not, it's not hampering our production either. 
and people that tell me that they just don't have room for a wall for these bins, I mean, look, guys, it's obviously it can be done anywhere. Uh, here's how we're doing the orange cards. Let me show you this. I'm actually really proud of this because twice before in the history of my practice, I have tried to go paperless, and my staff has pushed back so hard, and, and honestly, it's been hard, that I have just gone back to charts, gone back to charts. And one of the problems was I really, really, really like having treatment planned just on the top of a card or something that I can look at without having to look at a computer screen because I don't think there's no way anybody can walk into an op. So when you're in that op, what you got to know is you're in there to make a personal connection with that patient. They care more about the connection with you than they do anything else. When you start trying to get technical and all that, it just makes them nervous. So I've always loved a way that I could just glance at something, remind myself of what we're about to do, and then just go straight to the patient, look them in the eye, talk to them, make them feel better about everything. And it's just not possible with a computer screen for me to do that. I always would end up looking at the computer screen. Of course, it's never where you want it. And so you're trying to carry on a conversation with the patient, and then you're scrolling around, and you're trying to get on here, and you know, and it is, you can't hear what they're saying. They're probably telling you about their kid and what they just—they were in the play this weekend. How can in the world can you pay attention to that when you're uh, when you're fiddling around with the computer? So I've always liked having the orange cards, and I think anybody that you, who all is using orange cards already, by the way. All right, okay, several over there. I don't think there's any way around it. I think. What about do you, you guys like using them? You guys, it, as some people, I mean, it really has changed the way they presented treatment. I mean, it's a big deal. You just, I don't think you can do it in a computer software the way you can do it on paper. But so what did I say? We'll say, well, gosh, I would like to go paperless, but I just will not do without this orange card. So if I'm going to have a piece of paper anyway, what else could I put on this orange card that would, that I would, that I could use that would uh, let me do away with the rest of the chart. So, the front of it is just like the old orange card, except we gave a little more space at the top where we can put, you know, like the stuff, the stickers that go on the side of the chart. So now we actually file these big orange cards just like a chart. Put them in a, in a you know, in a cabinet just like the charts would go in. And on the back side, there's where our medical history is. Because I've always felt a little funny about scanning in a medical history. I mean, I just always liked the idea of having a medical history live. And, um, and so anyway, so that's it. Now we got this one big cardboard orange card, and that is our chart. Everything else that they sign gets scanned in, and we are paperless other than this. And this takes up a heck of a lot less space than a big old paper chart. Okay? Standards. We got the checklists. We got the scheduling. Uh, Kim, did you uh, did you cover scheduling in your class to the staff? Very little. You just spent too much time on the phone. That's okay. That's all right. Um, so here's our checklist. You know, we talked about this already yesterday. This is how we simplified that scheduling. Kim, by the way, is a wizard at scheduling. I have a tough time describing exactly what she does, but basically. She starts with something like we got on the left. Every day we have 12 cancellations in hygiene and three cancellations on the doctor, and it ends up looking like it is on the right, and we met our goal. I mean, that's basically, in a nutshell, what Kim does every day. I don't even know how she does it. I kind of know how she does it, but I, I'll let her tell you all sometime. Um, and this basically, clear communications for me. At some point, I made up my mind what I wanted to do. I stuck my flag in the ground. I said, look, guys, this is how we're doing it. Don't stand still. You've always got to work your plan, even when you're not sure what your plan is. I know dentists, as we, we as dentists have trouble sometimes. You hear the term paralysis by analysis. If you have a catastrophe, this is not the time to try to think everything through to the nth degree. You've got to make some decisions, even if they're wrong. You just got to get everybody moving in the right direction. And ultimately... Put your team's needs first, and the rest will follow.